Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and this is a video about enzymes. So specifically, we're going to talk about the structure of enzymes and then how enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. So let's get to it. So first, let's talk generally about the properties of enzymes. So it's important to know that um, I'm going to talk about enzymes as proteins. There are some examples of RNA-based enzymes as well, but I am not going to be discussing those in this particular video. So I'm focusing in on protein-based enzymes in this case. So what does that mean? Well, proteins are long chains of amino acids that fold up to form first secondary structures in the case of having alpha helices and beta sheets, and then tertiary structures where the R groups are going to interact, and then ultimately quaternary structures where multiple subunits come together to form the final form of a protein. So it's important to know that when we look at a model of a protein, we're going to end up seeing a folded up series of amino acids. There are sometimes other things that we will find interacting. So sometimes there are things like coenzymes, which might be a metal or something else that binds in there. But the predominant structure that we're going to see in a protein is going to be a long chain of amino acids. The other thing to know about this is because amino acids have R groups and those R groups have properties, the environment in which you put the protein is going to strongly impact how it folds up. So for example, if you were to change the temperature in which you find an enzyme, you are going to find that enzymes are going to have slightly different shapes in different temperatures. At lower temperatures, you're going to see fewer interactions between enzymes and their uh, substrate that they're going to be interacting with. And so fewer collisions between the active site, the area highlighted here in blue on this particular molecule, and the specific substrate that it's going to interact with at lower temperatures, there are fewer collisions, fewer interactions, less activity. As you warm the temperature up, the kinetic energy of all of the molecules increases, and so you're going to tend to see an increase in activity. That activity is only going to increase, though, up to a certain point, because at some point there will be a thermal stress on the protein, and the protein will start to denature or lose its shape. And as it loses its shape, it's going to lose its activity. So it's important to know that things like temperature, salinity, pH are all factors that will impact the folding of a protein and therefore the functionality of an enzyme. So let's talk about the structure of an enzyme, including its active site and how it specifically interacts with the substrate. So as a general rule, we think of, again, the proteins are going to be folded up and the folding is going to be based off of the R groups that are in that chain, so meaning what specific amino acids have been put together to make that chain. And as they fold up, there will be certain pockets. I often think of them as little nooks and crannies where there is going to be chemical properties or chemical attractions that will allow the fitting of certain substrates. In this particular example, I have two models. One that's sort of a cartoony model where you can see that the shapes that I have here, my rectangle and my hexagon, fit nicely into the shapes of my cartoon. And as a result, there's an induced fit where those, those two come together. You would envision that afterwards there will be a modification. Maybe these two things will be put together. Maybe they will be modified into uh, four smaller shapes or three different shapes or a whole bunch of different shapes as a result, um, but there's going to be a modification based off of that fit. Over on the right is a more realistic 3D model of an enzyme, again with that blue highlighted active shape, and what you can see is you see these two specific substrates that will fit in, and when these come together, they will be put together into a single molecule. And again, I think this looks mostly like a synthesis uh, reaction, and you can view it as either a cartoony model or as a 3D uh, model of a protein and a model of what some particular organic molecules would be that would fit in there. So some things to know. The chemical properties of the substrate and the chemical reactivity or the chemical properties of the amino acid side chains that you see in the active site are both crucial to the interaction between enzyme and substrate. Now, for an enzyme-mediated chemical reaction to occur, the shape and charge of those substrates must be compatible with that active site. That sort of builds off of our idea. So again, we have a specific substrate, we have a specific enzyme. It is both going to be a shape and a charge interaction that's going to bind these two. So moving around in space, there's going to be 
an affinity between the substrate and the active site that will make them, when they come in close proximity, interact in a specific way. And then the enzyme is going to provide a torsional stress on those molecules to, in this instance, you see, break them apart. Now, it is important to note, because there are properties on this protein, we could have an inhibitor come in and bind to that spot. And so it is entirely possible that there is a chemical that will bind more closely to the active site than the substrate. And so there are things known as inhibitors that are found that are competitive inhibitors that will bind to that active site and will block the activity of the enzyme by preventing substrates from interacting with the active site. There are also what are known as non-competitive inhibitors. And if you recall, a protein is a long chain of amino acids, and all of those amino acids have side chains, and all of those side chains have some chemical properties. So it is possible that there could be, in addition to the active site, a separate area on that enzyme where a inhibitor could bind. And as it binds, it changes. It has an allosteric effect on the overall shape of the protein because it binds there, and it actually changes the shape, closing off that active site. And so we refer to this as a non-competitive inhibitor. It's not binding in the active site and preventing the substrate from binding in, but by binding somewhere else on the protein, it is altering the shape of the active site and having an equal inhibition as we could see with competitive inhibitor. All right, so how do enzymes affect the rate of biological reaction? So the general way we talk about uh, these is we use the phrase that an enzyme is a biological catalyst. So what does that mean? A catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of reaction without being consumed by the reaction itself. So what they do is they take a reaction that is going from substrate to products or from reactants to products, and they just lower the amount of energy needed to put into the reaction. So this means that this substrate over here that turns into this product over here, it is a downhill reaction. It is something that will happen and will release some energy. But with an enzyme, what we'll see is it requires less activation energy to get that reaction started than if the enzyme wasn't present. And the reason that it does this, and again, remember, we have the active site and it has a particular shape, it has an affinity, what it does is it aligns the substrate molecule into a particular location and a particular environment that enables the rapid reaction to occur. And so, again, these reactions would happen if you were to heat up or to put other forms of energy into the situation, but because they're able to arrange the molecules in a particular way, they actually let this happen at lower temperatures or lower inputs of energy from the system. And so reactions still proceed from substrate to products, but they do so with less input of energy. Now, this happens to show a downhill reaction, and as I mentioned before, it is also equally likely that you would have enzymes that will produce the product has higher energy than the substrate or the reactant that goes in, but in that instance, it's still gonna lower the amount of activation energy needed in order to do that. Even when you are building a molecule or storing energy in a molecule, you have to put in additional energy to get over an activation energy hump in order to get that reaction to proceed. So in re regardless of the type of energy dynamics of the product relative to the substrate, you are going to have to put in less energy when an enzyme is present than without that enzyme present. All right, so again, the enzymes are biological cal catalysts. They facilitate that chemical reaction by cells by lowering the activation energy. What is the ultimate impact of that on a living system? So for us, we're human beings. We know that our body temperature is 37 degrees C or 98.6 Fahrenheit. And so the vast majority of the enzymes that work within our living systems work optimally at a 98 degree temperature. Now, it is entirely possible that we could take substances like a carbohydrate and break that carbohydrate down into uh, simpler sugars using, you know, just raw energy. So we could take in a sugar, but in order to break those bonds and to break a uh, polysaccharide up, specifically breaking starch up into monosaccharides, if we were to do that without the help of the enzyme amylase, we would have to raise our body temperature up in order to do that. Now, obviously, we are composed of macromolecules, and that would be bad for our macromolecules if we had to raise our temperature up 
above the set point of our, te our body temperature to have that occur. So enzymes allow the reactions to take place within living systems at temperatures that are appropriate for those living systems. All right, so I hope this review of enzymes was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.